You all know the story of Noah, don't you? And you remember the ending. The, the rains have fallen, the waters have receded, and God makes a bargain. This is a sign I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I've set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. There's something special and hopeful about a rainbow, isn't there? I suppose we can say that. Rainbows follow storms and maybe that's the reasons we love them. No matter how fierce a storm is, if we see a rainbow afterwards, it gives us hope. I got an email not so long ago with a wee picture of a rainbow and it said, if you can start the day without caffeine or pet pills, if you can be cheerful, ignoring your aches and pains, if you can resist complaining and boring people with all your troubles, if you can eat the same food every day and be grateful, if you can understand when your loved ones are too busy to give you any time, and if you can take criticism without resentment and resist treating a rich friend better than a poor friend, if you can conquer tension without medical help, relax without a drink, sleep without the aid of drugs, then, and this is probably where I lost it, you are the family dog. <laughs> but I laughed. Well, there was a rainbow and I found my rainbow and I laughed. Let's think about the story about Noah for a few moments and what it might say to us. It has some messages. I think it tells us how God deals with his erring children. I'm sure you've heard of the mother who was talking about three boys and said, my boys are very loyal to one another. She said, when one of them does something wrong, the others will not tell on him. And one of her friends said, how do you know then which one to punish? Oh, she says, it's not hard. She says, when one of them does something wrong, we just send them all to bed without television and without tea. The next morning, we just belt the one with the black eye. Well, every parent wishes it was that easy. The Bible is pretty explicit. We're sinners. We may try to joke it away, but we are. I once saw some graffiti that said, you must pay for your sins. But if you've already paid, please disregard this notice. Some of us have paid, haven't we? In Gone with the Wind, Scarlett O'Hara says, oh, it seemed so right when I did it, but it was all so wrong. If I had to do it over again, I would do it differently. And some of us will surely utter those words if we haven't done so already. There was a wee boy who was once given a fill-in-the-blank test on familiar sayings, and one of them was, cleanliness is next to blank. Cleanliness is next to, and the wee fella wrote, impossible. Well, overcoming our shortcomings is much the same. Rudyard Kipling uh, wrote a story called Letting the Jungle In, and it was about a group of people who went into the jungle, made a clearing, brought in their animals, planted their crops, and built their homes. And for a while it was paradise, until the rain years came and the jungle crept back in again. Wild animals killed their stock, the jungle moved in faster than they could cope with it. Of course, he wasn't writing about the jungle, he was writing about humanity. Kipling knew how thin is the veneer of civilization and how deep is the savage in man. Now if you disagree, pick up tomorrow's newspaper and you can make a fair case that the jungle's about to take over again. There's something of the jungle in each of us. I like the story of the man who was worse, a bit worse for the wear through drink, and he was standing before the court, and the judge eyed him and said, you're accused by your landlord of being drunk and setting fire to the bed. It's a lie, judge, he said. That bed was in fire when I got into it. But we should also know that there is something in us that keeps us from achieving our dreams. How do we deal with those forces within us that cause us to grieve the heart of God and often our, our loved ones? How can we live good lives in spite of what the Bible calls a flaw named sin? We can begin by remembering that God did create us for paradise. It's easy to become obsessed with our defects. I often wonder why Christians are often painted as killjoys, why clergy often seem morose. Why we often talk as Christians about the things that we don't believe it's right to do instead of talking about the things that we believe it is right to do. Remember why God created you. Take a whiff of the fresh morning air. Take a glance at the blue sky and remember who you are and why you're here. I don't know if you've ever heard of a fellow called Joseph Craig. He became known as the man who turns inkblots into angels. He taught in a village school. 
And often his pupils would leave big ink blots on their pages and other teachers would circle those ink blots in red ink. Joseph, however, would do something different. He would add a line here and a line there and out of the ink blots would come pictures of angels. So when the children were given back their papers, they were wonderfully decorated with angels and they were encouraged. He became a legend in his own time, known far and wide as the man who turned ink blots into angels. Well, there is another that I believe can do the same thing, who can turn ink blots into angels, who can take a life that's been beaten down and bring joy into it. After the storm comes the rainbow. I pray that whatever storm you're enduring, the rainbow is very near. Again, thank you for listening to me, and God bless you this week and always. Amen. <laughs>